of traditional talk, people pontificating about this or that, the left or the right. Sometimes the truth is just all lost in the noise. Having learned life lessons the hard way, Chuck Gallagher, international speaker and author, cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency. Nationally known guests talk about what's important to you, your life, your concerns, and your success. So tune in, turn on to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Now, here's your host, Chuck Gallagher. Hi, this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio, and thank you so much for joining us. I want to go back in time for just a moment and go with me on this journey. It was 1990. I was a tax partner in a CPA firm. I had testified before Congress. Uh, I'd written articles in national tax magazines, and, and I was teaching a continuing professional education course to a bunch of CPAs. Now, for those of you listening on the radio, you're probably thinking, oh my goodness, how boring would that be? But life seemed to be wonderful. I mean, I couldn't have asked for anything any better. And we broke for lunch. I was in Boise, Idaho. I'll never forget the, the, the location. But Boise, Idaho, my stomach was on East Coast time. My, uh, my body was in mountain time. I was kind of hungry, but I, I, we, we broke uh, to, to, to get a bite to eat. And there was a note on the door. It said, while you were out, call your office ASAP. And when I called the office... I was confronted with something that I had not anticipated and did not want to be confronted with. And that is, I was confronted with the truth. And the truth was that in the midst of all of the success, I had also made some incredibly stupid choices. And the consequences of those choices were staring me in the face. It was a crisis. I knew that life as I had created it for myself, for my wife, for my family, for the friends around me, for the partners that I had participated with in the firm, I knew that that life was going to change. In fact, if I survived the night, which was in question, the reality was I was in shock and other people's were or other people were going to be facing the shock of their life by what I was going to reveal. You see, I had created a Ponzi scheme. I didn't know what it was called at the time, but certainly that was not uh, a positive experience for anyone, especially someone that has been trusted as I was as a CPA. I only wish, I only wish that I had had access to Becky Sansbury and her new book, After the Shock, because I will tell you that I and many people around me were struggling, trying to put pieces back together from a life that I broke. Well, I would say intentionally, it certainly wasn't intentional at the time, but by my choices, it certainly was intentional because every choice has a consequence. So today, you need to listen to this show because if you have been faced with crisis, crisis because I lost a job, crisis because I was just told that my child was diagnosed with cancer, crisis because my husband or wife came home and said they found another love, crisis that takes place in life, crisis because you were diagnosed with something that you didn't want to face or that someone had broken trust, like I did with my wife. My guest today, Becky Sansbury, is an expert when it comes to crisis care. And I am so thrilled to have her and feature her new book, After the Shock, on this radio show called Straight Talk Radio. So, Becky, I'm so thrilled to have you. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Chuck. It's a privilege to be with you, particularly with someone who understands crisis as a reality. Yeah, crisis as a reality sucks. Now, that's just the easy, simple way to put it. And yet, Becky, you know and I know because of the work that you do and because of the experience that I've had that, um, I don't know how to put this, but if you live long enough, there are going to be times in life when we are faced with uh, what sometimes seems like insurmountable crisis. 
And um, I, I've got to ask you the question. You have written an incredible book. And I, and I have to say this. I don't always say this whenever I'm, I'm, I'm doing a show. I, I've had the opportunity to look at a lot of books, to read a lot of books. But, Becky, your book is um, – it's first class. Uh, it, it is. It is. It's quite amazing. Um, after the shock, getting you back on the road to resilience when crisis hits you head on was released this summer. And it has received literally a claim from every part of the country. So, okay, let's go backwards a little bit. Tell me a little bit about what motivated you to write this incredible book. Life and a Sacred Trust. I had the privilege of coming along in a time when I could choose any career I wanted to. Not all women get to do that. I happened to choose the career of ministry. And along the way, after some traditional paths and uh, some great life experiences, I hit some major bumps in the road myself. Between 1977 and 79, I lost three babies. Oh, my. And a few years later, uh, was blessed to have two children born to our family. So it took that roller coaster route for me. Shortly after our second daughter was born, my 33-year-old husband had a massive stroke, made a good physical recovery, unfortunately ended up with some very severe mental health challenges, which at that time he was not able or willing to address and put our family in peril. So the girls and I headed a different direction. Just to let your uh, listeners know, there are phoenix that rise out of the ashes, and he did eventually get help and restored himself to a good life, and our family has very much reconciled. So it is that roller coaster. As I took my courses and training in seminary, I realized that life does, like you say, it just hits you in the face. <laughs> and I wanted to be able to help people through those times, so I chose chaplaincy as that route did all the intense uh, theological and situational training, trained in a trauma medical center, and went through a, a year of those kinds of intense situations with folks and found that I had a calling to work uh, as a hospice chaplain. By the way, when I was hired as a hospice chaplain in 1989, people weren't talking about it. Oprah wasn't saying a word about hospice back then. <laughs> So when I had a chance for the job interview, I had to run to the library and find out what hospice was. Fortunately, it was like an arranged marriage. They needed a chaplain fast. I needed a job fast. We got together and fell in love. Oh, and I stayed awesome. with that program for 14 years. And during that time, I saw folks, as, as Dickens said, in the worst of times, and yet in some ways in the best of times, for those folks who found a way to even flourish in the midst of the most dire circumstance that life can throw at us. And I saw that there were patterns of resilience in those folks. And I admired that and I made metal note of it. In fact, I'm happy to say I even made a few physical notes of it. And along the way, uh, the, the uh, recession came and struck our country and I had the privilege of working with a team that walked along folks in career crisis and help them find their way through that challenging time. I stepped back and um, had, as anybody would, other family crises that come along, aging parents and uh, father who died and helping my mother learn how to be a widow. And suddenly I found myself in a unique situation with a second marriage that was ending and complete career indecision. I thought I was going to be heading into a business with someone who suddenly told me I was too old, not smart enough to be his business partner. And I was in a bit of a tough spot, Chuck. Maybe a little different from yours, but my own tough spot. Well, and, and tough spots come in different ways. And I've learned along the way, and I know you know the same thing is true. Uh, your tough spot is just as significant for you as my tough spot is for me, as someone else's is for them. Um, right. It becomes easy to judge other people's tough spots. And at the time, and at yet at the same time, we don't know as we walk through daily life what everybody's facing and what could take place. That's so true. So I was fortunate I hired a business coach to help me, and she said to me words that guided the development of this book. She said, Becky, 
Um, if you really want to help people, you must have a process and a product to give to them. Otherwise, it's just a lot of words. So that was when I sat down and took those years of experience, my own and others, and the professional training I'd had, and developed the After the Shock process, and then wrote the book based on it. Well, I have to say, uh, first thing, for those people that are listening, um, you've heard in short Becky's story. Um, Becky, I want to say this. The book is incredible. And for anybody that has um, come into that place in life where you are uh, situationally in shock or facing the shock of your life or trying to get back on track, if you go to Amazon.com and search after the shock, after the shock, with author Becky Sansbury, you can find the book there. And I've had an opportunity to to review the book. And Becky, we're going to talk about this after our next break, but you've got some really cool graphs in there. You've got some things that help this old analytical mind of mine <laughs> kind of kind of move past the emotion of the issue to understand the process of the issue. And you know, it's 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 easy to get caught up in the emotion sometimes and forget that uh, there's a lot of emotion that takes place, but if I move through the process, and understand what I'm supposed to do, it certainly can make that transformational process, or as you put it, the road to recovery, much easier. That's the plan. That's the plan. Now, we are about a minute away from a break, so I, I want to ask you a quick question okay. um, with the minute that we've got, and that is, you've had professional training, you've got a Master's in Divinity, you've had professional training, you have been a head chaplain with hospice I would suppose you've been through CPE training at Wake Med. That's, That's right. Uh, of, exactly. those, of those, which of those were most significant to you in writing the book? I would say the, the clinical pastoral education because it was right there in the trenches with folks. The theory helped, but the theory only does you so much good unless you use it. I can understand that. My wife went through CPE at Wake Med as well, so there's an interesting connection, even though you probably didn't know that. This is Chuck Gallagher. We're, we're, we're on Straight Talk Radio. My guest is Becky Sansbury, and she has written a great new book called After the Shock, getting you back on the road to resilience when crisis hits you head on. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about some of those shocks and some of the processes in this book that might be able to help. So stick with us. We'll be back in just a moment. Seeing the underlying principles of crisis response, stabilization, and resilience within multiple areas of disruption, Becky Sansbury, my guest here on Straight Talk Radio, has developed the new book, After the Shock, which provides a guide to individuals and organizations from a reactionary response to crisis to stabilization and eventually resilience. Now, that sounds like a lot of stuff to say. <laughs> But the reality is Becky has been able with training, with in-the-trenches work, with the experience personally to help people see what the process is that can move us forward to, as she puts it, resilience and back on the road to recovery, so to speak. Uh, Becky, let me ask you a question. You said you, you did, did continuing uh, or uh, CPE, uh, clinical pastoral education at Wake Med, and, and served in hospice. Tell us some stories about some of the experiences, without revealing personal information, that you saw, and how this book could have helped them through that. Why don't we take one couple and track them right through the process? Sure. How about Bill and Margie? Bill and Margie are your average middle-aged American couple working, two kids in high school, parents recently retired, off doing their retirement thing. Margie's not been feeling well. She does the right thing because she's a health nut. She runs, she eats those organic vegetables. She does all the things we're supposed to. After several appointments, her doctor sends her to a specialist. She's afraid. So Bill decides he'll take some time off from work and go with her. The doctor sits down very clinically, spouts a lot of medical language, and Bill hears four words, and four words only. Stage four, ovarian cancer. 
Beyond that, the conversation is a blur. They get handed a sheaf of papers, they walk out into the bright sunlight, and they can't believe that the rest of the world is still going on just like it was when they walked into the doctor's office because their world has just crashed. Mm -hmm. After multiple uh, medical procedures, chemotherapy treatments, and other avenues of, of medical care, it's determined that Margie really faces two choices. Either ongoing care that is going to do nothing but make her feel terrible, or what we call palliative care or comfort care with hospice support. And that's where I came into their world. One of the things that I think will guide all of us through this next segment of conversation is taking a look at the image that I use to help explain the after the shock process. Okay. That's something that they use to get to that medical appointment. And that's a car. We're pretty familiar with those. Four <laughs> tires, a frame, steering component, some fuel to make it go. And that's exactly the image of the after the shock process. So let me tell you quickly what those seven parts of the car are and then take uh, Bill and Margie through them. The four tires are four levels of ways that we can grip into, into stability, Chuck. It's like that's where the rubber meets the road. Cliche, right. but it works. Right. Those four tires we can compare to comfort, control, community, and connection to something beyond ourself. Those are our four grounding points in life, and they really, really help to stabilize us. Then we've got the frame of the car. That's like our experience, the experience that we're going through. When you crawl into your car, it protects you from everything else going on. When a person is in crisis, they feel like everything is falling apart. And they have to handle everything and decide everything. But really, what they need to do is focus on one thing, like crawling into that car frame and protecting them against everything else. And then within it, not only can they see perhaps where they want to go, but they've got the advantage of that rearview mirror. They can look back to other experiences and lessons and learn from them. And they can also have a passenger along to give them some guidance. But a car is not going to get you anywhere unless you can steer it. And we're steered by our assumptions and our beliefs. They head us where we need to go, but sometimes they head us where we don't want to go. So we've got to take a look at them and make sure that we're putting our energy into the ones that are going to head us the right way. And finally, just like we've got to have that fuel tank filled up in the car, we've got resources, our own and other people's, what we have, what we need and deciding what's going to be the best for the moment. So those are actually the seven steps of the after the shock process. Now we can step back and take Bill and Margie through ways that they can use those processes or those steps rather to help ease the bumps, no, the potholes that they have just fallen into. When we think about comfort, well, when you think about comfort, what when you are in a tough time, what helps you feel more comfortable? A glass of iced tea. But <laughs> that, that, that's, that's probably true. that is one of them. Yeah, that's probably not the most comforting thing, but you know, it'll it'll be a start. That's right. So there are the things that we're used to eating and drinking. I mean, why do people show up with casseroles? There's a good reason. It's comfort food. <clears throat> right. We we want to crawl into comfortable clothes. We want to be with people who make us feel comfortable. We may want our pets around us or not. <clears throat> we may have other parts of life, traditions or rituals that make us feel comfortable. And so all of those are important. So for Bill and Margie, one of the things that was important for them as soon as they left that doctor's appointment was realizing that, frankly, Starbucks is a comfort place for them. They needed to go there just to debrief for a few minutes and have that special cup of something that tasted good to them. We have, it seems sometimes like it's almost insignificant, but if there's anything that I've learned about crisis and getting through it, it is the little things that do help us get through the big things. 
So thinking about and paying attention to those things that make us feel comfortable is very important. Now, Becky, let, let, let me ask you a question, okay? Sure. Um, you're carrying us through Bill and Margie. Mm-hmm. But if I'm sitting here on the show, if, if I'm listening to this, I'm going to say, well, you know, gee, that sounds all really nice. I've just been told I have stage four freaking cancer. I'm not thinking about this process. I'm not thinking about tires. I'm not thinking about a car. I'm not thinking about a steering wheel. I'm not thinking about food. I'm not thinking. So yeah. how do how do you how do you find that first um I don't know what the word is, that first stopping point or starting point whenever you are so confused, you can't think straight. You're absolutely right. One of the things I tell folks is that crisis is an equal opportunity scrambler. It scrambles our <laughs> brains, it scrambles our schedules, our lives, everything. And it doesn't matter how well educated you are, how normally wise you are, or frankly, how wealthy you are. It does it to all of us, Chuck. So right. that is a great perception. One of the things that I encourage people to do right now is just like the firemen, the policemen, the, the folks in the military, make some preparations ahead of time. One of the things that I do in the book is I give folks a place where they can go ahead and write down what's important to me. What do, in any parts of, of this process, where do these fit in for me? When a crisis comes, I suggest that you hand that book to your spouse, to your best friend, to somebody you trust and say, I can't think of a thing, but I wrote some important things down here. Would, would you pay attention to them? So whether you do it in my book or a journal or a piece of paper that's stuck to the back of your computer, I really encourage folks when you're not in crisis, Make some notes about the people and the experiences and the parts of life that matter so that when crisis comes, you've got something. When you can't think straight, you can hand somebody something. It's kind of like keeping your password somewhere that somebody else can get them if you trust that person. Right. You know, Becky, it's interesting that you say that because um, for years I've been involved in the, uh, in the funeral industry in various forms. And one of the things, of course, is the concept of pre-planning. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about purchasing in advance, although that may make sense. But it's, it's that concept of when death occurs, um, who do you contact? Uh, right. My wife has been crystal clear with me. She said, okay, now I want you to contact these people. Here's where the list is. Here are the telephone numbers. I will keep the numbers updated. Here's what I want to have happen. She is aware of the fact that there is a mortality to life and that when her time comes, if I'm still living, this is what she wants to have happen. So in essence, you're saying prepare for the crisis, mm -hmm. hoping perhaps that the crisis might never come. That's exactly why the police, the firemen, the military train and prepare and train and prepare so that when crisis comes, they move into that automatic mode of being able to take care of the rest of us. You know, you, um, you, you, we're, we're get pushing close on a break, but you talk about, and we need to get back to Bill and Margie, but you talk about chronic crisis, life-altering change, acute crisis, and difficulty. And so I think one of the things that we can talk about after you carry us through the, uh, the, the rest of your example is understanding that there are different types of crises that will come into our life, and that probably creates different types or different levels of response. Absolutely. It does, both in ourselves and the people around us. Because right. we have to remember those other folks may set off their panic buttons, too. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating that you say that before we go to break in a minute. And that is what happens in our life when, when and, and I don't know the circumstance and I don't need to, by the way, but you said, um, you know, a second marriage failed. Well, Somewhere along that process, either you made that decision or he made that decision, but whoever made it first, it still had an impact on someone else, much like me making the choices that I made and having to come home and tell my partners that I was at the time nothing more than a liar and a thief and the same to my wife. It mm -hmm. set off a ripple effect. That impacted many, many people. And uh, I can promise you, I know that my wife would have benefited from um, from your book after the shock because certainly it was a crisis and it was a shock to her. 
This is Chuck Gallagher. I'm with Straight Talk Radio, and my guest is Becky Sansbury. She is the author of a great new book called After the Shock, Getting You Back on the Road to Resilience When Crisis Hits You Head On. And we will be back after this break and talk more. Okay. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. And if you have ever been in crisis, you've lost a job, your employer said, I'm sorry, we're downsizing. Your wife said, um, nah, I don't think this is working. Or th you made choices that could be um, significant and change things. Uh, uh, poor financial transactions, bankruptcy, DUI. Uh, caring for an ill parent. There's a multitude of things that we face in life that are crisis. And this great, great new book by my guest, Becky Sansbury, After the Shock, getting you back on the road to resilience when crisis hits you head on can be found on Amazon. And I highly encourage you to pick up a copy of this. This is probably the best book that I have seen on this topic ever. Mm -hmm. um, so I am thrilled to have Becky you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chuck. Man, that's that's a great lead in and I truly appreciate it. Well, it, you know, you've been this book has been acclaimed by so many people. And after having an opportunity to take a look, it was like it's it's quite incredible. Becky, you were talking to us about um, this couple, so to speak, Bill mm -hmm. and Margie, and yep. kind of leading us through the, the process when she was diagnosed with stage four. I think you said it was ovarian cancer. Right. Carry us on this journey a bit. Certainly. So Bill and Margie, and I, uh, to help them, the aspect of comfort, we touched on that in the first yes. segment. You raised a great question. So how do you make your way through this process when you can't even recall your name? This is where you really need um, a safe stranger, I call it, that person who you trust, but is not the person you go home with every night. And a person who can help bring some discernment, some calm, and walk beside you. Sometimes it's a professional, and it may be from the medical community, from, from your background, from the financial community. It may be a wise friend. It may be someone that has been a bit of a friend, but not too close, who has that safe distance. But that's how you get your way through this until you start to figure out at least how to spell your name again. Right. So let's take a look quickly at these next uh, phases of going through stability. The next is <laughs> so obvious. Everything's out of control. What I have found, Chuck, is that when people can find even one tiny thing from their day-to-day -day life over which they feel they can regain some control, even if it's making sure they get up and for a gentleman shave their face in the morning, then it makes other tiny aspects of control start to come into line. And also we feel like I've got some shred of control and it is indeed a stabilizing factor. The next part is our community, community of family, friends, coworkers, faith group, civic organizations, neighborhood, whatever it may be. These are the folks that you reach out to. Sometimes it means swallowing your pride, but it means that we've got that extra wheel on the ground. People who know me enough or someone I can give this book to and say, read this and help me figure this out. Uh, but a variety of folks who can come together because ultimately not everybody has all the answers and not everybody is going to have the stamina to see me through the whole way of the course. Becky, on the community thing, let me ask you, I, I want to ask you two questions. Sure. And um, these are probably both a bit out there, but um, mm -hmm. let's talk for just a moment about um, people who are facing crisis and perhaps who choose suicide as a solution. Mm -hmm. Um I, I'm going to be the first to say on this show, I, I am not an expert in your area in any way, shape, or form, but it would appear that when crisis is so deep and the dark night of the soul is so powerful that you choose suicide, perhaps what is missing is community. Is that willingness to reach out to other people and to believe that those other people can have anything that would be of value to you? 
Do you have any thoughts on that? Very briefly, Chuck, I think there's two ways of looking at this. There's the ongoing mental health challenge that drives a person to suicide. And then there's the situational grief, despondency, uh, overwhelm, uh, sense of guilt that would send someone to it. I am not going to address at all the mental health issues. That's a far deeper and more complex issue. Situationally, you are right that it takes either me, the person in crisis, reaching out or hopefully having someone or more than one someone in my life who will reach directly to me. On a, on a day when I was having a major crisis of my soul, I happened to be working with that business coach who realized the desperation I was in. And here's what she did, and it ties right back to control. She said, Becky, I'm giving you an assignment. And normally we wouldn't talk again till next week, but I want you to have this assignment ready tomorrow morning when we're going to talk again at nine o'clock. In fact, I want you to email this assignment to me before 10 o'clock tonight. And then uh, we'll talk about it tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. She gave me something that I could do. And then she gave me the opportunity to be in control of my sense of responsibility to meet my assignment. And indeed, I completed that assignment. I made it through that night and I did talk to her at nine o'clock the next morning. And a few days ago, I went back into my um, electronic files. I found that assignment. I reread it and I gave great thanks for her and for what she had handed to me that allowed me to feel a shred of control over my life again. You know, Becky, something that just really strikes me um, from what you just said, uh, because I, uh, I I know in the family, in my family, there have been people that had uh, um, chosen suicide. And mm -hmm. um, the interesting part of what you just said, which I really think is valuable to people, is if you find someone is in, find that someone is incredibly depressed, we may not have the skill or talent to be able to move them through depression. But we certainly can recognize when people are depressed, despondent, then give them something to do. Create an experience that allows them, as you just said, to be in control and a create create a way to follow up. Because at least if there is something to do and something to follow up with outside of anything else, mm -hmm. I don't have to be a psychiatrist, psychologist, or have a master's in divinity or have any skill, but I certainly can say, hey, can you do this for me? Can you have it back to me by a certain time and realize that you are actually doing something that is beneficial and helpful? Absolutely. And actually, that leads us right to that fourth tire. We need a connection to something that's beyond myself or just yourself. We need to be tied to things that are bigger. For some people, they find that in their formal religion or a general spirituality. People find it in politics. They find it in sports. They find it in allegiance to their alma mater. They find it in all kinds of, in nature, in music, the arts. But it's something that's bigger than me. And it helps me put my life and my situation in context. Now, I may not sit here and analyze it and say, I'm putting my life into context through cheering <laughs> on my favorite football team this weekend. But that's what we're doing. And that then allows us to feel that final part of stability. What happened, whether it was Bill or Margie or me or you or whoever, is we can then take that and crawl into our frame of current experience with something on the ground under us, more than just a frame of a car sitting on the ground. Right. And when we are there, then we can breathe just a little bit because there's something that happens when you close that car door. You know, you're just tucked inside there. And that's what we need to do for ourselves and for other people is help them find that safe spot where they can kind of tuck inside and let the other things go on around them. They don't have to take care of it all. I don't have to take care of it all. And so whether you are the safe stranger for somebody or you're the person right in the bullseye, this is an important opportunity because then 
we can catch that breath you were talking about earlier when you can't even think and you are able to say, you know, I haven't been through this, but I went through, uh, I, I went through the experience when this happened to my grandmother. I went through a time when my colleague had something similar happen, or I even, I read it in a book or I saw it in the movies. Something that helps to get our mind focused on there are life lessons here. And then if you come up with a complete blank, remember you've got that safe stranger, that passenger with you, that's a whole lot better than Siri or GPS, as great as they are. <laughs> we need people. And sometimes we need just one or two people. That's probably the reason I like to drive a car that only holds a few people rather than a van with 15, uh, as I did back in the days when I was a youth leader. I, I get lost in all that noise and confusion. But one or two people... That's a great help, and it helps me sift through those life lessons that, that work. And at that point, then you're ready to steer. You know, Becky, I, um, I do have one question. We're coming up on a break. Mm -hmm. um, but I get, I, it, maybe it's just me, so I'm going to say that on the front end on this radio right. show, but I get so irritated when someone has an issue or a challenge, and you're they're telling you about their issue or challenge, and somebody else then immediately steers it back to them. Okay. Like, you know, I was diagnosed with cancer. Well, when I was diagnosed, and then they go off onto this tirade, and it's like, wait a minute. This isn't about you. Yeah. It's about me. I'm the one needing to have, an, to, to have a talk. Now, we got 30 seconds. Any comments on that before we go to break? Don't ever say, I know exactly how you feel. You don't. Right. That is it's absolutely true. You one don't thing to know how to But you don't know exactly how that other person feels. This is Chuck Gallagher. We're on Straight Talk Radio. Uh, my guest is Becky Sansbury. She has been working over 25 years with individuals and organizations focused on crisis care. She has writ and written a wonderful new book, After the Shock, getting you back on the road to resilience when crisis hits you head on. We're finishing up the third segment of our show. You stick with us. We'll be back in just a minute to talk more with Becky. If you've ever had a crisis or ever been in crisis, you know what that's like. Um, in many years back, in 1997, I was diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. I was shocked when I got that diagnosis. Um, it, it was not something that I anticipated. I was a bit too young for that, but it happens. And then the question is, what next? My guest is Becky Sansbury. She has written this wonderful book called After the Shock, getting you back on the road to resilience when crisis hits you head on. So Becky, let's get back on the road to how do we, how do we help people who are dealing with shock or how do those people who are dealing with shock find that ability to get help? Chuck, one of the best things that we can do is be quiet briefly look and listen. It's amazing when we feel that we're a friend to someone or we're in a family with someone and they get whammed and the immediate reaction for us as bystanders, even loving bystanders, is I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Fortunately, for the majority of people, they figure out something, even if it's, like I said, showing up with a casserole. That's not such a bad thing. And hugs are good too. But sometimes people get scared away and simply become invisible. Invisible support can be, I guess, helpful. You're sending good energy their way. But we need a lot more than that. So paying attention to what's this person like in their normal day-to-day -day life when they're not in crisis. How do they run their life? What's, what do they do? Where do they go? How do they keep themselves? What's important? What do they like? And suddenly in the midst of that, we can find ways that's appropriate for us to fit in, whether it is providing things, whether it's providing services, whether it is saying, do you, do you want to go bowling tonight to just get your mind off of things? Whatever it may be, or, or providing help for the family. One of the things that's very important to be aware of 
is what we, we look at in the sixth out of the seventh step of the process. And that's what's that person's beliefs or assumptions? What guides them through life? One of the ones that I found so frequently that could be either a huge help or an incredible hindrance was this one. My family and my friends will be there for me through all of this. Now, when that mm. works, wow, they're right next to person's uh, religious faith. There's nothing more powerful than that. But let's face it, Chuck, sometimes people just aren't equipped to help. Sometimes they lose interest. Sometimes they just flat wear out in the process and they fall by the wayside. That means the person in crisis has got two devastations to deal with. One, I don't have the help I was counting on. And two, man, if, if I believe this and this is false, then maybe everything I believe is false. So it's making sure that we can look at or make adjustments in life for those beliefs and assumptions that are going to work for us. And if you have any awareness of what a person believes, then being there to help support that is really important for them. It's like helping them steer the car. And the now, final one is... But, but, wait, wait, but before no. you go there, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I've got a question. Um, okay. So you're going through a divorce. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we need uh, people close to us, friends and family. But family is splintered on the divorce, mm -hmm. and friends are splintered on the divorce, which means that then you end up with um, fractured groups, so to speak. You know, it's it, it, not to be funny with this statement, but it's like being an American. But are you a uh, Bernie Sanders Democrat or a Donald Trump Republican because they are so far apart that it's hard to find the common ground of where you're going to get support just as an American citizen. Mm -hmm. That's a great point, Chuck. One of the things, if you are the person in the crisis that you need to quickly do is simply a, find for yourself the one or two people that you do identify with with whom you do feel safe and who will be a bit of your chart and compass right now. Because you're absolutely right, what we have counted on socially, sometimes within our church, heaven forbid you work in the same place. You are going to have those extremes and pools of difference and fracture. But again, it's coming down to just a few people, a few experiences, taking on a few problems one at a time. And that's one of the toughest things in crisis is feeling like I have to take care of everybody. I have to take care of every problem. I have to pay every bill today. I have to solve everything for my child in school today. And it's bringing your world down into a tighter focus to just take on one or two things at a time, to just align with one or two people at a time, and to just address one or two things in yourself at a time. Okay, that makes sense. Then you're able to use and take a look at resources. What do I have? What do I need? Who can help me get what I perceive that I need? And who can also help me take a look at, maybe I've changed cars, theoretically. Now, not in actuality, but if we're going to use this car image, have you ever changed cars, perhaps going from um, a hybrid to a diesel-driven car or some other form of fuel? Well, n not exactly. I've changed cars plenty of time, but nothing that's terribly dramatic. Well, just suppose you had been driving a diesel-driven car, and suddenly you made a choice to go into a hybrid, but you pulled into the Shell station and you tried to pump diesel fuel into it. What do you think right. is going to happen to that yeah, car? Yeah, it's not going to be too good. No, not no. Pretty. And that's often what happens. A crisis either temporarily or permanently changes the resources that we have and that we need. And so, again, having that safe stranger with us or that companion who helps us take a look at, oh, buddy, I think you need to move down to the next pump. That's where you're going to get what you need for right now. Remembering that some of those decisions and choices that we make in a time of crisis don't need to be our permanent ones. Therefore, right now, therefore, this time, when your arm is broken, you put it in a splint to help it heal. 
But if it heals properly, you don't go through the rest of your life wearing a splint. At least right. I hope not. Right. And so, or a sling. So there are things that we do in the midst of crisis, whether it's through resources, the people that we're with, what comforts us, the choices we make that help us through that time so that we can get on to another time and make more permanent choices for our life when things are stable and our brains aren't so scrambled. When, um, when crisis hits, you have uh, indicated, and we're coming up toward the end of the show, but you've indicated that there are different types of crisis. You know, there's those crises that will last for the rest of our lives, mm -hmm. and there are those crises that happen that seem like the world just came to an end, and yet we know that over time it will ultimately resolve. How do you, and quickly, how do you address the difference between a job loss and a cancer diagnosis, yet on the day for that person, it seems both potentially quite significant. You acknowledge the immediate pain. Have you ever had a really bad paper cut? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I hate those things. Yep. They hurt like mad. And frankly, depending on where that cut occurs, it can be very inconvenient. But hopefully, if you take care of it within a day or two, you're going to be able to use that finger or that part of your hand or whatever it is pretty well again. It is being both with yourself and with another person patient to understand that it hurts like mad right now, but also that perspective point of it's not going to hurt forever. That's a tough thing to do for yourself unless you're an extremely balanced person, but it is something that you can do for someone else. Becky, I appreciate you taking the time with me. If you want to find Becky, it's at Becky Sansbury, S A N S B U R Y dot com. Becky Sansbury dot com. Her book is After the Shock Getting You Back on the Road to Resilience When Crisis Hits You Head On. Look, I'm going to make a recommendation here. Go to Amazon, find the book, and buy the book. And the reason I'm suggesting this is if you are currently in shock or going through a challenge in life, the book is outstanding. And I would also suggest this is the book that you want to buy and have available so when someone next door or in your family has a problem, give them a copy of the book. Don't wait and try to remember what it is. It's after the shock, getting you back on the road to resilience when crisis hits you head on. Becky, I want to give you high praise for the book. Okay. It is absolutely wonderful. And thank you for what you are doing to try to help people who are dealing with life-changing circumstances. Again, my guest is Becky Sansbury. The book is After the Shock. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. Thank you for joining us on this show. And stay tuned for more enlightening shows just like this. Remember, every choice we make has a consequence. This is Chuck Gallagher. Bye-bye. You've been listening to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Tune in each week on TransformationTalkRadio.com each Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern as Chuck Gallagher, international speaker and author, cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency. Nationally known guests talk about what's important to you, your life, your concerns, and your success. Visit ChuckGallagher.com for more information and turn on to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Thank <laughs> you.